What do you fear most about the outdoors? Chances are bears probably top the list. Grizzlies in particular seem to awaken a deep primal dread, almost as if they're the real world embodiment of the monsters many of us feared as children. That fear, though mostly unjustified, is magnified by media reports and online commentators who prey on and dramatize tragedies. And recently, they've had a lot to prey on. In addition to several non-fatal incidents, there have been four fatal bear attacks in North America in seven months, leaving six people dead. A mother and her one-year-old son were killed by a polar bear as they exited a school in a small town in Alaska. An Arizona man was attacked without provocation and fatally wounded by a black bear. A teacher jogging in the woods near West Yellowstone stumbled upon a mother grizzly and was subsequently attacked and killed. And finally, an experienced outdoor couple and their dog were killed while backpacking in Banff National Park. And unsurprisingly, the unusually high number of bear attacks has rekindled an old, reckless, and mostly absurd debate over whether a gun or bear spray is the best defense in the backcountry. Now, it's totally natural to wonder which defense system gives you the best odds of survival, but the answer is a bit complicated, and unfortunately the internet's penchant for weapons-grade bull has only made it more difficult to get a reliable answer to this decades-old debate. Today, we are going to lay all the baggage and fairy tales aside and end this nauseating argument once and for all. Now, this is going to be one of my more direct videos. I could spend a lot of time trying to sugarcoat information and appease everyone's personal palate, but I find it's better and more effective to just speak plainly. So here we go. It's grown-up time. If you want to know how to best protect yourself in bear country, this is the holy grail of bear safety videos. You have chosen wisely. If you're looking for fairy tales or to argue your politics, I guarantee you'll be happier somewhere else. Let's get things rolling by ripping off the proverbial band-aid. The, the very notion of guns versus bear spray is the very epitome of a false dichotomy. Any perceived rivalry between these two defense systems is completely wrong-headed, irresponsible, and imaginary. Anyone who treats this conversation as a rivalry doesn't know what they're talking about and potentially putting your life in danger. Now, for centuries, guns were the dominant tool to defend oneself, family, and property against aggressive bears. But that changed dramatically in the 1980s when pepper spray, already a popular tool for self-defense, got a major buff. In the nearly four decades since being invented, bear spray has established itself as an indispensable self-defense tool in the backcountry. By 2010, bear spray was credited with a 90% success rate against aggression by all three North American bear species. And that record has seemingly only improved with time. According to Tom Smith, one of the authors of much of the definitive research on backcountry deterrence, Bear spray is currently credited with an undeniably impressive 98% success rate. Now, is that 98% gospel? Probably not. And ideally, the study of attacks and deterrence will continue and the availability and quality of data will improve. However, whatever the exact figure, bear spray is not 100% effective. A fact perpetually exploited by ignorant internet trolls who seek out and magnify a handful of incidents where bear spray seemingly failed. It's an asinine and dangerous practice, and honestly borders on legal negligence. While extremely effective, bear spray does have some limitations. The one that every talking head on the internet loves to discuss is wind. And it's true, wind does affect the range of bear spray. But as is often the case, most commentators are either unqualified or negligent in their commentary. Depending on brand, age, and temperature, bear spray is typically rated for use between 20 and 40 feet. Strong head or crosswinds significantly reduce the effective range of bear spray to approximately 2 meters. And statistically, wind has interfered with the deployment of bear spray in approximately 7% of cases. But, while a headwind will reduce the effective range, a tailwind will increase it. There's also the possibility of blowback, where the user and or bystanders are negatively affected. Current available data suggests that this happens about 14% of the time. However, the overwhelming majority of blowback cases are minor and not debilitating, an outcome that is clearly preferable to being attacked by a bear. 
The point is this, you need to know your defensive tool, its proper use and remain aware of your surroundings. Be mindful of the terrain, brush, wind and ambient noise, all of which may reduce your or a bear's ability to avoid an unwanted encounter. Regardless of what deterrent you carry, there is no substitute for situational awareness in the backcountry and practiced repeatable proficiency with your defensive tools. As I've discussed in past videos, bear spray also loses pressure over time, so be mindful of the expiration date and replace your canisters regularly. Also be aware that at extreme low temperatures, bear spray has a somewhat reduced range of approximately 4 meters. Now, I wanted to include a segment on how to use bear spray correctly, but in order to keep this video a reasonable length, I had to cut out the instruction portion. In the future, I'm going to release a video outlining the ABCs of bear attacks, and I'll include detailed bear spray and firearm instruction in that video. So make sure to subscribe and turn on notifications to get immediate access when it drops. Now, before we move on to firearms, their efficacy, strengths, and limitations, let's debunk some of the popular bits of nonsense you've heard or will hear about bear spray. Bear spray doesn't work on an angry slash predatory slash whatever bear. Let's just take a moment and examine the logic of these tidbits of social wisdom. If a bear is charging you, I have news for you. The bear is probably already angry. That or it thinks you're prey. Either way, you have better things to worry about than upsetting the bear's emotional state. A bear's weaponry is formidable, but it is useless at long range. When kept at a distance, you have the advantage. At close range, the advantage goes to the bear. And both bear spray and the right gun in the right hands are very capable of keeping bears at bay if they meet their target. People do miss, and on rare occasions, bears at full sprint do sometimes penetrate the initial cloud of spray. One such incident occurred in 2016 when Todd Orr was attacked twice by a mother grizzly after she charged through his bear spray. Now, I've since had the pleasure of talking to Todd personally about his experience and intend to share a more detailed examination of the attack in the future. And in discussing Todd's experience and whether it ought to undermine faith in bear spray or whether bear spray can deter an angry or predatory bear, Tom Smith told me, when a bear is hit square in the face with bear spray, it overrides attitude and induces involuntary spasms, pain, and disorientation. It does not matter if it's a really mad bear. Bear spray is a powerful tool, but it's not an impenetrable force field, and it needs to be deployed and handled responsibly. In recent years, bear spray has unfortunately become a popular weapon for political terrorists. And while the overwhelming majority of victims suffer excruciating but temporary pain, some have suffered chemical burns and even eye damage. This isn't your keychain pepper spray. It's nasty stuff, and it can absolutely deter an enraged bear. And while most bears won't need a direct spray to the face, some may require a more substantial blast. Regardless of what deterrent you carry, make sure that you practice and train regularly and responsibly. A few years ago, I was training someone on how to use bear spray. Now, I won't use any names, but for our purposes today, we'll call this individual mom. After discussing how to remove the safety clip and fire the spray, the individual, popped the clip off and then unknowingly pointed the canister directly at my face with her thumb on the release lever. I immediately pushed the canister away and fortunately no spray was expelled. But nowadays I favor practicing with an inert can first and strongly suggest that you do the same. Now there are no sponsors for this video, but I've included links to various EPA approved bear spray canisters as well as inert practice canisters and other training accessories below in the description. If you need a practice canister or a canister of bear spray, then make sure to check out the links in the description. Now, one final bit of bear spray nonsense that you may hear someday is that bear spray works well on curious bears, but not attacking bears. In general, it's far easier to dissuade a curious bear compared to an attacking bear. And that's a true statement regardless of what deterrent you're using. Bears have different personalities and motivations, and naturally some bears will be harder to deter than others, a fact that is not unique to bear spray users. Bear spray is in fact very capable of stopping an attacking bear. According to Tom Smith, attack interventions with bear spray are typically very successful, close to 100%.
But make sure to stay tuned for my bear attack ABCs video for important differences on how to respond to black bears, grizzly bears, and polar bears. Bear spray users in general suffer significantly lower fatality and injury rates compared with gun users. But there are a few documented fatalities when bear spray was used, including the attack in Banff National Park that I mentioned earlier. But despite a handful of failed deployments, bear spray remains an indispensable backcountry tool. Now, where bear spray is designed to overwhelm and brutalize a bear's senses, guns are designed to cripple and kill. They can also be used to frighten bears, but discharging a gun has also at times instigated a charge or an attack. Nuanced enough for you yet? Well, strap in. There's a ton of stuff online about guns as bear defense, and honestly, while there are a few quality resources, the vast majority of videos and publications are nothing but very unhelpful and often dangerously ill-informed noise. Now, before we go over the details, there are four facts that you need to keep in mind as we discuss the efficacy of guns as a tool for backcountry defense. First, the discussion of guns as bear defense is far more complex than the discussion of bear spray as a deterrent. Second, the skill threshold needed to reliably use a gun to deter or eliminate an aggressive bear is much, much higher than the skill threshold needed to operate bear spray effectively. Third, confidence is not the same as competence. And fourth, there is no intelligent reason why someone who is sufficiently skilled with a gun shouldn't also carry and be proficient with bear spray. Now of necessity, we're going to undertake both a macro and micro examination of the very best data available. Otherwise, we'd get only half the picture and fall into the exact same trap as a thousand other internet commentators. Beyond my own considerable experience with bears, I'm relying heavily on my discussions with Tom Smith, who, along with fellow world-leading bear biologist Stephen Herrero, hasn't only published landmark research on bear attacks and effective deterrence, but is currently heading up a database that has analyzed more than 1,000 bear attacks in North America. And last I spoke with him, it sounded like he intended to make that database public at some point in the future. So make sure to stay tuned for updates. As we discuss guns as bear defense, I'm also going to reference a growing catalog of human bear conflicts where guns, specifically handguns, were successfully used during a bear encounter, charge, or attack, as compiled by Ammoland.com, an online, quote, shooting sports publication. There are, however, limits to the accuracy of both sources. For example, Tom Smith and his colleagues acknowledge that the firearm success rate may be higher than their data has demonstrated. Similarly, the running tally compiled by Ammoland has missed or overlooked numerous cases with unsuccessful outcomes, a few of which we'll be discussing in the next few minutes. And having read their methodology, their data stream omits cases where the gun was not fired and is driven largely by referrals or uncorroborated accounts from their readership resulting in a data set skewed artificially towards successful outcomes. Dead men tell no tales, as they say, and people who succeed in deterring or killing bears are far more likely to share their stories when compared with people who screwed up. But flawed data is still useful. You just have to be aware of its limitations. Tom Smith, Stephen Herrero, and their colleagues have superior access to incident reports from both state and federal agencies and underwent strenuous peer review before publishing their findings. So I will be treating their work as the more reliable resource. I again stress that the research referenced was never intended to fuel a rivalry between guns and bear spray, but rather to quote, identify factors associated with the successful use of a firearm in bear human conflicts in order to promote both human safety in bear country and bear conservation. Smith, Herrero, and their colleagues analyzed over a century's worth of human bear conflicts in Alaska, including 269 documented incidents involving 440 people and at least 367 bears. 81% of those incidents involved grizzlies, 11% black bears, and 2% polar bears. Smith, Herrero, and their fellow authors determined that long guns successfully stopped aggression by bears 76% of the time. Handguns were deemed successful 84% of the time. And while it's tempting to take that data and conclude that handguns are the better defense option, 
Tom Smith and his colleagues concluded that an 8% variance is not sufficient to draw a conclusion on whether a long gun or a handgun is the better defensive tool. Now, in addition to practicing with a variety of long and short guns myself, I have spoken at length with Smith about the mechanics of deploying guns during a bear encounter and some of the reasons why guns and gun users have failed to deter a charging or attacking bear. Based on his published research, in 21% of cases, users didn't use the firearm. In 9% of cases, the bear was deemed too close for deployment. Now, some of you might say, well, that's obviously the reason the gun didn't work, because it wasn't used. Well, torpedo incoming. Strangely, there was no statistical difference in injury rates between those who used a gun and those who had a gun but did not or could not use it. Translation, the roughly 76 to 84% firearm success rate is still very much applicable when a gun is actually used. Remember how I said that bear spray isn't a guarantee? Well, guns are not a guarantee either. And you should know that Smith and his colleagues found that gun users suffered a 56% injury rate, which is effectively the same as the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service's conclusion of a 50% injury rate among gun users. Beyond not being used, there are several reasons why guns sometimes fail to deter an aggressive bear. In 14% of the cases analyzed by Smith and his colleagues, guns suffered mechanical issues like jamming or misfire. And the shooter missed in 9% of incidents. And in 8% of incidents, the gun was emptied and couldn't be reloaded. And in another 8% of cases, the safety was engaged and the user was unable to unlock it in time. In 3% of cases, the user actually tripped and fell while trying to shoot the bear. And in 1% of cases, gunfire actually triggered the bear's aggression and ended further use of the gun. Now, I want to draw your attention to that last figure. At 1%, you could be forgiven for overlooking a less obvious but still critical detail. We tend to view human bear conflicts as explosive surprise attacks, but that view is incomplete. Sometimes the bear has already charged but stopped or grounded their target. Other times they're displaying other threatening behaviors like slapping the ground, growling, or stalking people. Human bear conflicts don't fit one mold. If you're relying on a firearm, you need to be able to read the terrain and the situation well. Because not only are bears and other wildlife broadly protected and cases of bear shootings investigated, but once a bear charges, the statistical odds of stopping an attack with bullets drop sevenfold. The reason? There is a massive difference between shooting stationary targets at the range or lining up a shot while hunting and successfully stopping a bear that's charging you at 30 or 40 miles per hour, or viciously attacking your companion. That wasn't a very good draw. Now, people do it successfully, but to reliably ward off a bear, you need to achieve a much higher level of proficiency with an appropriate firearm than most gun users realize. And even then, unless you shoot like the man with no name, and you can't, by the way, the outcome is not as certain as many people would like to believe. A fact that I'm sure will upset a number of you based on comments left on my other videos, but it's nonetheless true. Which brings me to one of the most dangerous aspects of the nauseating guns versus bear spray debate. Any intelligent or experienced shooter knows that both guns and shooters are not all equal. So what person in their right mind would tell everyone to carry a gun, or claim a gun is, quote, better protection in bear country. So much depends on the person using it, and it's painfully obvious that not everyone should be carrying a gun. But I keep waiting for commentators to grow a spine and include that fact in the discussion. Instead, commentators are peddling the same tired, dangerous half-truths and fictions that are sending underprepared people into the backcountry, who are a liability to themselves and others. I was recently watching a couple of YouTubers discuss bear defense options, and unsurprisingly, the two hosts took the false dichotomy route, treating bear spray and guns like competing defensive options, but then made one of the most dangerously negligent comments I have ever heard someone make on the topic. Well, there are problems with bear spray, said one of the hosts, like, quote, inadvertent activation. His co-host, of course, nodding in parroted agreement. Honestly, I was shocked. Here are two guys trusted by many in the outdoor community talking about guns and bear spray, and they were actually pretending that, quote, inadvertent activation was a problem unique to bear spray. 
Uh, it's a problem with guns too, except we call it negligent discharge. And the consequences of negligence with a firearm are orders of magnitude more severe than the, quote, inadvertent activation of bear spray. 2023 has been one of the deadliest bear attack years in decades. Six people dead in North America alone. Anybody want to venture a guess how many people die each year in the United States from someone negligently handling a firearm? Answer, between 400 and 500 people. And those are only the deaths. According to the National Institutes of Health, there are between 70,000 and 90,000 non-fatal gun-related injuries every year in the United States. And roughly 40 to 60% of those injuries are unintentional, meaning that effectively half of all non-fatal gun-related injuries are the result of someone negligently handling a firearm. Now, some might feel that citing all fatal and non-fatal injuries resulting from negligence is an unfair comparison when discussing backcountry safety. Here's why they're wrong. Depending on the year, as many as a quarter of accidental gun deaths occur in the backcountry, and they include people who were attacked by a bear and someone tried to intervene but accidentally shot the person being attacked. If you're carrying a gun and expect to deploy it reliably during a bear attack, you'll need to spend thousands of dollars acquiring an appropriate firearm and ammunition and then spend hundreds of hours practicing and firing. For those carrying in the backcountry, the gun you choose will be a constant part of your life. You'll need to know your gun inside and out, how well it feeds various ammunition types and if and when it jams. It means knowing how it functions under varied conditions and shooting thousands of rounds, running drills, refining technique, and responsibly storing, transporting, and maintaining your weapon at peak functionality before you can consistently rely on your gun or your abilities to save your life in the backcountry. And most of that training and prep work will likely take place in a residential or urban setting. If you're good with those prerequisites and want to choose a gun for defense in the backcountry, here are several things you should carefully consider when making your selection. First, be extremely wary of most of the internet's advice. Anecdotally, a wide variety of firearms have been successfully used to deter or stop aggressive bears. But I could also find you at least two cases where someone used a pocket knife to fend off a grizzly bear. But only an ignorant psychopath would advise that you pack a pocket knife to defend yourself in grizzly country. Some people will tell you that a 9mm is enough, and they'll likely point to the experience of one Phil Shoemaker, an Alaskan fishing guide, who killed a large grizzly boar with his 9mm pistol. But the problem with the reporting and online commentary regarding Phil's story is that the universe gifted Phil a sweetheart setup when he shot and killed that bear in 2016. I'll link Phil's own account in the description, but to summarize, he took two clients, a husband and wife, to a fishing stream, opted to leave his vastly more powerful 44 Magnum at home, and instead rely on his 9mm pistol loaded with 147 grain hard cast bullets. Phil and his clients had previously startled the bear, which ran into the brush, allowing Phil a luxurious amount of time to ready his gun. Shortly thereafter, the bear charged at Phil's clients, who responded by falling backwards into the deep grass. The bear, quote, highly agitated, had apparently come to a stop and was, quote, standing above his clients when Phil took his first shot, which struck the bear in the neck. The bear reacted by growling and spinning towards the impact. Aiming for the bear's vitals, Phil then says he fired five more shots before the bear ran off, at which point Phil shot it one more time, hitting the bear in the pelvis as it ran away. The bear apparently dropped shortly after the seventh shot impacted. So while it is possible to take down a grizzly with a small pistol under ideal conditions, don't head into bear country expecting to repeat Phil's experience. Unfortunately, every commentator gushing over Phil's story is either ignoring or ignorant, effectively the same word, by the way, of the messages that they ought to be sharing. First, events could have easily unfolded very differently. For example, the bear could have decided to attack first. More aggressive bears often do attack without warning. Second, why did Phil's clients seemingly not have deterrence themselves? A solid blast of bear spray from two people who stood their ground is pretty much guaranteed to send a bear running and resolve the situation faster, without injuries, or needing to kill the bear. 
There is no intelligent reason for Phil and his clients to not carry bear spray. Third, Phil's story clearly illustrates why you should travel with companions in brown bear country. Competent, responsible companions are the absolute best deterrent there is. Even well-prepared travelers sometimes startle a bear before they can ready their deterrent. Having someone nearby who can intervene with an appropriate deterrent saves lives every single year. Fourth, Phil was fortunate that he was a spectator when the bear charged his clients. There is a universe of difference between shooting a charging bear that is threatening you and shooting a stationary bear that is threatening someone else. Had Phil been the bear's target, he probably would have gotten a few shots off given the fact that the bear gave him plenty of time to ready his gun. But Phil's shots would really need to count. Because bears can take a remarkable amount of damage and still be very capable of seriously injuring people. Here's a video of a black bear falling 50 to 60 feet after being shot at least once, if not three times. And shortly after impacting the ground, this bear tore into the guy waiting at the bottom of the tree. You'll also notice that there were a bunch of hunting dogs at the base of the tree as well, yet the bear went after the guy. If you haven't watched my video on how dogs increase the likelihood of being attacked, make sure to put it on your watch list. And you should know that statistically, Guns are approximately 38 times more likely to stop or deter a charging or attacking black bear. But you're also very likely to deter a black bear by yelling, throwing rocks and sticks, or using bear spray. Now, while all bears are potentially very dangerous when wounded, grizzlies and polar bears can take a lot more punishment. Lewis and Clark, while crossing the continent in the early 19th century, reported encountering a very large brown bear that was, quote, extremely hard to kill. Meriwether Lewis claimed that despite five balls through his lungs and five others in various parts, the bear swam halfway across a river to a sandbar, dying a full 20 minutes after reaching the small sandy island. Now, according to Lewis, this grizzly made no attempt to attack, but just imagine what an adrenaline-charged, wounded grizzly could do with 20 minutes if it had attacked. We actually don't have to imagine, because there are numerous cases of grizzlies viciously attacking even after being mortally wounded. In 1956, Kenneth Scott shot an 800-pound grizzly in the chest, puncturing both lungs as it attacked his friend Viv Squires. After being shot, the bear retreated, and Scott and Squires decided to track the bear down and finish it off. After waiting an hour for the bear to succumb to its wounds, the pair found the boar and both began firing. Scott's rifle jammed after one or two shots. Viv emptied his 30 odd six rifle into the bear's chest. And while attempting to reload and ready their rifles, the grizzly charged, savagely attacking Scott, who attempted to fight back with a hunting knife. Two of Scott and Viv's friends eventually came to their aid and delivered the final kill shot, but it was too late. Kenneth Scott would survive for hours before finally succumbing to his wounds. More recent examples include Steve Stevenson, who in 2011 was killed after his hunting companion mistakenly shot a grizzly, confusing it for a black bear. Steve is said to have yelled and drawn the bear away from his young companion, who eventually managed to shoot and kill the bear as it attacked Steve. It remains unclear how many shots it took to actually kill the bear, but an autopsy later revealed that one of those shots had struck Steve in the chest. So what's the message? Many, many influencers and perhaps every hunting and gun publication on the planet have taken a stab at answering that question. The Alaska Department of Game and Fish, in addition to warning that wounded bears are often a greater threat, cautions that even heavy handguns like the 44 Magnum may be inadequate in emergency situations, especially in untrained hands. Further suggesting that a 300 Magnum rifle or shotgun with rifle slugs are more appropriate weapons if you need to shoot a bear. If selecting a rifle, consider a semi-auto or lever-action variety. While bolt-action rifles are perhaps the most popular among hunters and often sufficiently powerful to incapacitate a bear with one well-placed shot, they are also cumbersome and hampered by a relatively slow rate of fire, low ammunition capacity, and the fact that they are typically scoped and not designed for rapid deployment or close-quarters defense where bear attacks typically occur. Rifles in general suffer from deployment and close quarters limitations, but the semi-auto or lever action varieties may allow for more rapid fire and less recoil, making landing multiple shots more likely. Handguns are easier to carry, often quicker to deploy, and better suited for close quarters shooting. 
but generally provide vastly reduced stopping power. For decades, large bore revolvers like the 44 Magnum or bigger were the dominant choice of sidearm for those traveling in grizzly country. The recently 10 mm semi-automatic handguns have become very, very popular. They offer similar power to a 357 Magnum, but with less recoil, faster rate of fire, and greater capacity. Whatever you choose to carry, you want to choose an ammunition type with sufficient penetrating power. Hard cast lead bullets are broadly recommended, but others may work as well. But even with a theoretical perfect gun bullet combo, it still may not be enough. You have to be highly proficient with the tool you select. And even if you're a current member of SEAL Team 6, remember, deterring a raging bear is not the same as engaging in an urban firefight. If you encounter a bear, ready your deterrent immediately. And if the bear charges, stand your ground and deploy your deterrent. Backing up either quickly or slowly during a charge will do two things that can get you killed. First, it tells the bear that you are a soft target and not a threat, thus incentivizing further aggression. And two, backing up increases the likelihood of tripping and falling on your butt, which is the last place you want to be, especially when you're blasting away with a gun. Just ask Lee Francis, a hunter who in 2022 successfully warded off a grizzly with his 10 millimeter pistol, but shot himself in the leg in the process after falling down. Lee later said of his experience that, quote, bear spray wouldn't have worked. He's wrong, but he's not the first to be deceived. The wrongheaded debate over deterrence is responsible for sabotaging and endangering a great many people. Now, I've been shooting for most of my life with greater emphasis over the past few months as I prepared for this video. I've visited various ranges and shooting areas, and after speaking with other shooters, it's clear that many are skeptical, if not outright antagonistic towards bear spray. And it's unfortunate. As I've said, bear spray is remarkably effective, easier to use, and non-lethal to both humans and bears alike, and may even condition previously sprayed bears to stay clear of people. The benefits of carrying bear spray are not logically contestable. But it's also undeniable that the right gun in the right hands can end a threat once and for all if it persists. If you remain aware of your surroundings, know how to carry and use bear spray, are sufficiently proficient with the right gun, and travel in groups of two or more, you can confidently explore bear country with an uncommon depth of defensive capability, should the need arise. But I'm also not going to blow sunshine up your whatever. In addition to giving yourself defensive options in the backcountry, you are taking on serious responsibility if you choose to carry a gun. Speaking of his years of experience in the field, Tom Smith put it this way, When I've been on the Kenai River and every other guy is carrying a huge gun, I'm way more worried about that than I am about some brown bear coming in and hurting somebody. You know, these are very powerful handguns, and people aren't as good as they'd like to think with them. And I definitely echo that concern. After hundreds of bear encounters, including a few close calls, I'm far more concerned about the guy wandering around the woods with a hand cannon and an overdeveloped sense of confidence. Tom Smith advises, there are people who are extremely adept and skilled with firearms. I would carry one, but I'd carry bear spray as well. There is also perhaps one more caution inherent in carrying both bear spray and a gun. Bears don't have a complex set of if-then conditions to sort through before attacking. You often don't have time to vacillate between defensive options when facing down a bear. So make sure you know when to use each deterrent long before entering the backcountry. Now, it sounds complicated, but it's not. In addressing the issue, Tom Smith once recounted to me an exchange he had on the subject of how and when to choose your deterrent. Somebody asked me, would you throw down your gun to use bear spray? To which he responded, well, if I have a gun in my arm, and I mean... I'm in the field ready position with one in the chamber and all that, and the bear comes out of the brush at 30 feet, I'll start shooting it. But if it's a little more advanced notice, no, I would definitely shoulder my weapon and put the bear spray out there because I know it's very, very effective. But adding, you've got to have a way to deal with these animals. They're too big, too powerful, too fast. You can't outrun them, you can't beat them up. You have no business in bear country without a deterrent. Now, if you're traveling in heavy cover, and are just nervous about the possibility of a bear encounter, it's ridiculously reckless to walk around with your gun cocked and locked and ready to start blasting at anything that moves. Keep your gun holstered until you know there's a threat, and then exercise caution before pulling the trigger. 
You're just as likely to shoot your buddy or someone else if you carry or deploy your gun irresponsibly. And as I said earlier, that's the far more likely scenario than a bear attack. If you haven't seen a bear, but are traveling through thick cover, carry your bear spray in your hand at the ready. That's exactly what I was doing in 2015 when my wife and I stumbled upon a grizzly on a kill at 30 feet in the low evening light. And I thank God above that the bear did not react aggressively and that we were able to immediately and safely leave the area. But I'm also grateful that I had my bear spray already in my hand and ready to fire. Now, if you encounter a bear and there's a strong headwind, the gun might be your better option. And you'll have to use your best judgment. But given the ease of use and proven efficacy, I'm gonna go ahead and suggest that bear spray should be your default. And if the bear still poses a threat, be ready to shoot to kill. And you should also know that there are restrictions on both bear spray and guns. Some national parks in the United States do not permit bear spray within park boundaries. Though I expect that to change in some cases if grizzlies are reintroduced to places like California. And guns are banned from all Canadian national parks. You can get permission in some cases to transport them across Canadian parks, but you cannot take them on the trails and in the backcountry. Since 2010, guns are permitted in U.S. national parks, but discharging a gun is illegal within national park boundaries. Now, I'm definitely not of the opinion that government agencies and their policies are above scrutiny or criticism. That wouldn't be very American of me. Government demands scrutiny, but then again, so does the internet. After all, how are we supposed to intelligently scrutinize public lands policies and government officials if we filled our heads with the internet's BS? If there's one takeaway from our discussion today, I hope it's that bear spray, guns, and the internet are all very effective tools in the right hands, but that each is very prone to negligence and abuse. The internet itself is saturated with enough weapons-grade bull to make the Twilight series seem like a serialized documentary by comparison. And the internet's garbage advice isn't only a threat to people, it's a threat to our irreplaceable wild spaces and the iconic animals that inhabit them. Bears are not monsters. Every bear you see on my channel is a bear that I encountered personally. Conflicts do occur and travelers should know how to respond. But remember Phil Shoemaker, the guy who shot and killed a bear with his nine millimeter pistol? Of his own account, Phil's been guiding hunters, photographers, and fishermen for 33 years. But despite numerous close encounters with bears, he had never previously had to shoot an unwounded bear in his defense or the defense of others. Now, human safety is clearly my primary goal, a goal that is in no way at odds with preserving wild spaces and wildlife, including bears. For years, I have been watching the internet misinform people on every topic under the sun. And after decades of exploring bear country, with hundreds of encounters under my belt, writing about bear attacks and reviewing the best information out there, I can't remain silent anymore. The record needs to be set straight. People like you need to know the truth about how to stay safe in bear country. And you shouldn't have to wade through endless crap to find the information you need. Thanks to the ongoing study of bear behavior, attacks, and deterrence, it's possible for people and bears to share space. We have the tools, and I invite you to help get the message out. Internet algorithms are designed to farm you for money, which means they advance what keeps your attention, not what is trustworthy. The thing most likely to get you killed in the backcountry isn't a bear, it's garbage advice. Please consider sharing this video so that people can finally sift through the bull and get the information they need in order to safely explore the backcountry. I also invite you to re-watch this video and return to At Home in Wild Spaces often for the best bear safety videos and much, much more. And if you appreciate legitimately reliable resources and the effort it takes to produce them, then join our team on Patreon and help At Home in Wild Spaces produce the best outdoor content found anywhere. Now, before wrapping up, I want to offer a huge thanks to Tom Smith for generously sharing his time and his expertise. And until next time, this is Mike wishing you safety and life-changing success on all your Wild Spaces adventures.